M S W Media. Big shout out today to Helix Sleep. Take their two-minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and use code HELIXPARTNER. And this episode is sponsored by Lumi, a doctor-developed, skin-safe, pH balance, and aluminum-free deodorant. New customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code DAILYBEANS at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, October 30th, 2023. Today, Judge Tanya Chutkin has lifted her stay on the Trump limited gag order in D.C. The Lewiston, Maine mass shooter was found dead with two apparent self-inflicted gunshot wounds to the head this weekend. Another mass shooting in Miami, killing two and injuring 18 others, took place at a crowded Halloween party. More disturbing details emerge about Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson as he decides not to fund Ukraine. The Department of Justice recommends a 10-year sentence for Trump State Department appointee Federico Klein. Donald Trump and all three of his adult children are set to testify in the New York Attorney General's civil fraud trial. And an audit is underway into the $19,000 imaginary lectern purchased by Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hey, everyone. Happy Monday. I hope you had a restful weekend. Dana is still traveling. She'll be back with me this week. Thanks for hanging with me in the meantime. Today, I'll be speaking with the amazing John Cryer about his new podcast in partnership with Jack Bryan. If you remember, Jack Bryan is the writer and director of the Active Measures documentary. And the podcast is called Lawyers, Guns and Money. And I can't wait to speak with him about it. I can't wait to speak with him about anything, but I'm really excited about this podcast. Also, we had such a huge positive response last week to John Fugelsang's appearance that I'm happy to announce he'll be joining us for the interview every Friday, starting November 2nd, for Fugelsang Fridays. So tell a friend. Also this week, I'll be speaking with a member of the White House National Security Council about the importance of funding Ukraine and the funding plan proposed by President Biden in his Oval Office speech. I'll also be joined by Lee McGowan of the I Am Politics Girl podcast and Brian Tyler Cohen and their efforts in Wisconsin. And I'll be speaking with Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn about his new book, Standing My Ground. Also, Donald Trump and all three of his adult children will be testifying in the New York civil fraud trial between November 1st and November 6th, maybe beyond that. Depends on how many days each spend on the stand. And Pete and I are going to cover that on this Wednesday's Clean Up on All 45 podcast, while we also will be having legal analysts for CNN and senior fellow at Brookings, Norm Eisen, with us to discuss the latest in Fulton County. When do I sleep? Uh, also, breaking news just out right this second as I sat down to record this show, Judge Tanya Chutkin has lifted the temporary stay on her limited gag order on Donald Trump in the D.C. case that Jack Smith brought. Uh, now, we don't have that filing yet. Pacer is down. I'm following Kyle Cheney and some others on Twitter for when that comes out. And of course, you know that Andy and I will cover it on the next episode of Jack. But there is a new episode of Jack out right now you can listen to. And we discussed the filings, for, you know, that came over the past uh, few days in the past week or so in that particular matter for the limited gag order. So we'll be looking forward to uh, talking about her lifting the gag order and reading her decision soon. Also, over the weekend, Steve Pearson from the How We Win podcast and I set up a fund for MSW Media to raise money for the Democratic opponents of the 18 quote unquote moderate Republicans that voted for Mike Johnson that represent districts won by Biden in 2020. There's a link in the show notes to donate, even if it's just a dollar. If we can get everybody listening to pitch in a dollar, we will be so much closer to our goal. You can really help us flip the house and send a message that we, the voters, will not stand for election-denying Christo-fascist bigots in government. So head to swingleft.org slash fundraise slash how we win 2024. Every tiny little bit helps. We have to flip the house so that these seditionists aren't in control on January 6, 2025. And just over the weekend, by the way, on the soft launch on a tweet or two, 
We've managed to raise nearly $30,000 for this fund. So thanks to all who have chipped in. Again, that's swingleft.org slash fundraise slash how we win 2024 or click the link in the show notes. Finally, uh, this episode is dedicated to the memory of Matthew Perry. He was an incredible light in the world for so many. Funny, witty, and just so giving of himself. May his memory bring laughter and comfort to all of us for years to come. All right, everybody, we have a lot of news to get to. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. First up from NBC, the 40-year-old firearms instructor suspected of killing 18 people Wednesday at two businesses in Lewiston, Maine, was found dead on Friday, according to officials. Robert Card's body was found near Androscoggin River, that's in Lisbon Falls, at about 7.45 p.m. That's according to Maine Public Safety Commissioner Mike Sasuchuk, I believe, or Saschuk is how you pronounce his name. I'm not sure. I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. Quote, he had an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound, he said to a late night news conference officially announcing his death. It is unclear when he died, he said, and officials didn't provide an exact location, although we did learn later it was in an overflow lot of a place where he used to work. Leo Madden, a former executive at Maine Recycling in Lisbon Falls, said Card had worked at that facility, but couldn't say whether he'd been recently fired or had left on his own. Close relatives and loved ones of the victims and the shooter were informed of the news before the news conference. Quote, I just don't want to forget the families that are grieving and will continue to grieve. That's Police Chief David St. Pierre. Card was found dead after a massive manhunt, uh, described earlier as a full court press for more than 350 law enforcement personnel that were all involved in the search. An arrest warrant had been issued for Card for eight counts of murder, state police said Thursday morning. The eight counts were based on the initial identification of eight of the 18, and the number of counts would have gone up. That was uh, from state police Colonel William Ross. Uh, As of now, all 18 have been identified. And in a related story from CBS, a fight between two groups turned deadly in Tampa when a shooting during a Halloween party resulted in two deaths and 18 people hospitalized early Sunday morning. Officers responded to the shooting in Tampa just before 3 a.m. on the 1600 block of East 7th Avenue. That's according to Tampa Police Chief Lee Burkaw during a press conference at the scene. The fight occurred in an area with several bars and clubs, and there were a large number of late-night revelers in the area at the time. Police were not immediately sure if the people involved in the fight were inside any of the bars before the shooting. Video posted online shows people in Halloween costumes drinking and talking on the street when shots rang out, creating a stampede. Some people toppled over metal tables and took cover behind them. Video from the aftermath shows police officers treating several people on the ground. A volley of about a dozen shots rang out, followed by another volley of about eight. One suspect turned himself into police, and investigators believe there were at least two shooters involved. Police are still investigating the reason for the fight between the two groups. We'll keep you posted. All right, over to NBC. Uh, New House Speaker. Mike Johnson, said Sunday that aid to Israel will be considered on the House floor in a standalone measure this week and expressed confidence it would pass, resisting President Biden's call for Congress to provide a broader package that also includes aid to Ukraine. Also, by the way, incidentally included not just aid to Ukraine and Israel, but the Indo-Pacific and also the border. Quote, we're going to move for a standalone Israel funding bill this week in the House. I know our colleagues, our Republican colleagues in the Senate have a similar measure That's what Johnson said in a Fox interview on Sunday, on Sunday Morning Futures, adding that he believes there will be bipartisan support for this particular measure. Quote, there are lots of things going on around the world that we have to address and we will. But right now, what's happening in Israel takes the immediate attention. And I think we've got to separate that and get it through. The aid to Israel in the Biden administration's request includes funding for the country's air and missile defense system readiness and including support for the Iron Dome. Money would also go toward replenishing the DOD stockpiles that the White House said are being drawn down to support Israel. That's uh, increasing U.S. embassy security as well, according to a White House fact sheet. A day after he won his bid for speaker that ended a 22-day stalemate in the House, Johnson met with Biden at the White House last week while attending a bipartisan briefing about the administration's request to Congress for additional funding. 
The White House had submitted two new funding requests to Congress last week, $56 billion in additional domestic funding, including $23 billion for disaster relief, $16 billion for child care, and $6 billion toward providing Internet access to low-income households. Funding for national security and energy assistance, addressing the opioid epidemic, and providing food assistance programs was also included in the request. Now, before he was elected speaker, Johnson last month voted with 93 Republicans to cut off aid to Ukraine. After he became speaker, Johnson said that he's asked White House staff to bifurcate aid to Israel and Ukraine. He also stressed that the U.S. needs to take action against Russia to stop its advances. Quote, we can't allow Vladimir Putin to prevail in Ukraine because I don't believe it would stop there. That's what Mike Johnson said in an interview on Fox News the day he was sworn in. And it would probably encourage and empower China to perhaps make a move on Taiwan. We have these concerns. We're not going to abandon them. Really? Because it sounds like you just fucking did. Why would you bifurcate this? Why not pass it all at once? I don't understand. Next up from Josh Marshall, a Talking Points memo on Speaker Mike Johnson's first full day in office. Half the journalism world was looking into uh, the surprise speaker's past. In his meteoric one-day rise from four-term representative to speaker, there was no time for anyone to vet him. But one part of the past came out of left field. Video surfaced of an interview Johnson did with Walter Isaacson just after the death of George Floyd in 2020, in which he revealed that he had an adopted black son, Michael. Johnson went on to explain that there was no question that his black 14-year-old son, Michael, faced challenges that his white 14-year-old son, Will, never would. Many on the leftward side of the political spectrum were struck by Johnson's empathy and frank recognition of discrimination in contemporary America, while right-wingers denounced him for his wokeness. Now, this is from the Talking Points memo. I had only heard this story in passing until this evening when a Talking Points memo reader flagged something odd about the story. No African-American son shows up in any of his family photographs on his house website or his personal Facebook page, nor does Michael figure anywhere in any of the Johnson's campaign biographies. As I went further down this rabbit hole tonight, I was a bit dumbfounded. Is Michael made up? Is he excluded from family pictures? I was so baffled that I went pretty far down that rabbit hole trying to figure out what was going on. A bit more poking around revealed that Michael also came up a year earlier in a House hearing on reparations in June 2019. Johnson opposed reparations and noted that his black son Michael did too. In response to jeering from spectators at the hearing, Johnson departed from his prepared remarks to invoke Michael. Let me finish. Listen, wait a minute. Many of my colleagues on this committee might not be aware, in addition to our four children at home, my wife and I have a much older son who happens to be African-American. We took custody of Michael and made him part of our family 22 years ago when we were just newlyweds and Michael was just 14 and out on the streets on a dangerous path. Now, a bit later in his remarks, Johnson said, I asked Michael this weekend what he thinks about the idea of reparations. In a very thoughtful way, he explained his opposition. I was able to piece the story together from the introduction to the full video of the 2020 interview and a write-up in The Advocate that centered on the 2019 reparations hearing. In Johnson's interview with Walter Isaacson, it sounds like he's talking about two 14-year-old boys of the same age, but if you listen closely, he refers to Michael at that age in the past tense. Michael was 36 in June 2019 and presumably 40 today. Johnson's 51. This isn't clear in the clip that's been circulating, or at least it wasn't to me, but Johnson wasn't being misleading because the chronology is explained earlier in the interview. Johnson said at the hearing that he and his wife took custody of Michael in 1997 or so. So the exact relationship with Michael is uncertain, and it's unclear whether the Johnsons ever adopted him. It sounds like the relationship may have been more of a fostering relationship and that the Johnsons consider him a son in an informal sense. But again, it's simply not clear. When the advocate asked Johnson's spokeswoman, Ainsley Holyfield, to elaborate on the relationship between Michael and the Johnson family back in 2019, she told the paper, the congressman will not be commenting further than what was said in committee out of respect for Michael, his privacy, and their relationship. And yes, um, Matt Gates also has the adopted son, Nestor. Um, so I don't know, something weird's happening. Next up, from Ryan Riley at NBC. He has a new book out, by the way, called Sedition Hunters. You should get it. As a Republican who played a key role in trying to overturn the 2020 election results, was elected Speaker of the House on Wednesday, a U.S. Capitol Police officer testified in federal court about the lingering impact of the brutal attack perpetrated by a mob on January 6th. 
U.S. Capitol Police Officer Caroline Edwards. You might remember her from the January 6th hearings. She was the first officer seriously injured in the riot. She testified Wednesday afternoon in the bench trial of Ryan Samsel and four other Trump supporters. Samsel, who was carrying an enormous flag that featured Trump depicted as Rambo, is accused of pushing a metal bike rack into officers, causing Edwards to stumble back and hit her head briefly uh, and black out. Now, Samsel is on trial before U.S. District Judge uh, Gia M. Cobb, alongside co-defendants James Tate Grant, Paul Russell Johnson, Stephen Chase Randolph, and Jason Benjamin Blythe. Edwards testified Wednesday that she and other officers, quote, were in the line of defense on the west side of the Capitol. After the initial breach of the barricades near Peace Circle, rioters viciously assaulted law enforcement officers and overtook the platform that had been set up for President Joe Biden's inauguration. As Samsell and other rioters broke the barricades on January 6th, Edwards testified, she lost her footing and hit her head on a metal handrail behind her. I landed with my head on the stairs, she said. The last thing she remembered was the clank she heard when her jaw hit metal. Adrenaline took over, she said, saying that uh, when another officer told her they had to move, she immediately focused in despite feeling dazed and confused. Quote, the lights were on, Edwards said, describing her demeanor, but no one was home. At that point, Edwards said, she believed the rioters were trying to get to the inauguration platform to tear it down. Call after call flooded in over her radio, request for assistance as the mob took over the Capitol. At one point, she said, Samsel approached her, giving her back the beanie that had fallen off her head during the initial breach. Samsel kept telling her that he was one of the ones who helped pick her up off the ground after the fall. Edwards said that she placated him. Yeah, okay, thanks. But that she felt he was trying to convince her of something. She was uncomfortable, she said, uh, when Samsel placed his hand on her. There was so much to do as the chaos unfolded, she said, and Edward stayed in the fight. I knew that I was hurt, but it just wasn't a factor. Another call cracked over the radio. A rioter breached an evacuation route, she said, and Edwards handcuffed the person and took him into prisoner processing at the headquarters of the building. Edwards started feeling groggy and dizzy, she said, and wasn't quite sure what was happening, so she asked a colleague where the computers were, even though she had been to headquarters and used the computers before adding that uh, when she sat down in front of the monitor, it was like there were two of them. She remembers feeling exhausted and then blacked out again. She wasn't sure for how long, but she remembered waking up slumped over a chair in a cold sweat. Another officer said her face looked crooked and asked her whether she'd been struck. They called an ambulance. She felt a dull pain in her jaw and head. Hospitals were full, so the ambulance took her to Silver Spring, Maryland, where the hospital personnel put her in a neck collar and gave her a CT scan. Absolutely excruciating, she said. She's describing the pain she began feeling in her head. She felt like screaming and like throwing up, like crying, is what she told the court. It felt like someone had taken her head and tried to tear it apart. Edwards is now a peer support counselor for other officers, helping officers who had emotional trauma after the attack. Several officers who served at the Capitol on January 6th have died by suicide, including Jeffrey Smith, who was found to have died in the line of duty because his suicide was a direct result of the assaults he endured on, the, on that day. Now, Samsel is represented by Stanley Woodward. That's the Washington attorney who represents several other January 6th defendants, as well as Trump aides like Pete Navarro, who have been caught up in the federal investigation being run by special counsel Jack Smith. Another one of the aides, Walt Nauda, was charged in the classified documents case in Florida and has pled not guilty. During cross-examination... Woodward noted the incredibly difficult situation Edwards had gone through. Woodward asked Edwards about the emotional strain she'd been through in the year since January 6th and whether she'd agree that she'd lived with a lot of stress. I believe we all have, she replied. And from the Department of Justice, the United States of America, by and through its attorney, the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia, respectfully submits this sentencing memorandum in connection with the above-captioned matter, for the reasons set forth herein, the government requests that this court sentence Federico Klein to 120 months of incarceration, near the midpoint of the guidelines range, to be followed by three years of supervised release, $2,000 in restitution, and a fine in the amount of $47,187 and an $870 special assessment. They go on to say that on the afternoon of January 6th, Klein a 42-year-old former member of the U.S. Marine Corps and presidential appointee to the State Department, joined the large mob fighting against the police on the West Plaza, 
While there, he shoved police officers who were trying to control the crowd and protect the building, including U.S. Capitol Police Officer Harvell. During that assault, Klein called out, you can't stop this. He also called rioters behind him for help in pushing against the police. When the mob broke through the police line on the West Plaza, Klein and others surged forward to the Lower West Terrace Tunnel. After entering the tunnel, he forcibly pushed against officers with his body and stolen police riot shields. At one point, when it appeared the police were going to be able to finally close one set of doors behind them and the rioters, creating an advantageous barrier, Klein wedged a police riot shield in between the doors, helping to force the doors back open and allowing rioters to continue their assaults on police. In total, Klein was in or around the tunnel for approximately 90 minutes. Klein was convicted of eight felonies, including six assaults, civil disorder and obstruction of an official proceeding, and four misdemeanors following a bench trial. The government recommends the court sentence Klein to 120 months, that's 10 years of incarceration, near the midpoint of the advisory guidelines range of 108 to 135 months, which the government submits is the correct guidelines calculation. We'll keep you posted on that sentencing. And from the Associated Press, from targeting Chinese-owned farmland to banning gender-neutral terms like pregnant people from state documents, Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders has rolled out announcements in recent weeks in quick succession, cheered on by her Republican base. The former White House press secretary, known for scaling back regular press briefings in Washington, has also fielded questions from behind a lectern at the state capitol. But it's the lectern she's not using, a $19,000 purchase that's led to an audit and claims her office illegally altered public records, that remains a problem for the first-term governor. That lectern hasn't been seen at Sanders' public events, and the governor's office won't say where it is, but questions about its cost and how its purchase was handled haven't gone away so easily. Sanders has dismissed such questions as manufactured controversy and even shided reporters for chasing what she called tabloid gossip. But whether it's that or a legitimate matter of public accountability— The lectern purchase has drawn the attention of everyone, from late-night comic Jimmy Kimmel to the New York Times, and it could hamper the governor's effort to emerge in the vanguard of next-generation Republican leaders nationally. Sanders appeared eager to move on and has invoked a strategy familiar to followers of the Trump administration, change the subject and blame the media. But she has helped sustain the story in part by refusing to answer basic questions about the purchase. Where's the lectern now? who told a governor's employee to add the words to be reimbursed to an invoice after the state Republican Party paid for the lectern, which was originally purchased months earlier with a state-issued credit card. And why isn't she using it now when she makes new announcements? She made a stab at that last question when asked directly why she wasn't using the pricey lectern at recent news conferences, because I figure if I do, you would talk about nothing else instead of the important actions that we're really actually taking today. Now, an audit approved by an all-Republican legislative panel is underway into the 39-inch-tall, wood-paneled blue lectern. The Republican Party of Arkansas reimbursed the state for the purchase on September 14th, and Sanders' office has called the use of a state credit card for a lectern an accounting error. And even as she's dismissed questions about the purchase, Sanders has also said she's welcoming the audit and urged that it be completed quickly. The purchase was initially flagged by Matt Campbell, a lawyer and blogger, who has a long history of Freedom of Information Act requests that have uncovered questionable spending and other misdeeds by elected officials. Now, days before Sanders proposed FOI changes, Freedom of Information changes, Campbell filed a lawsuit over the state blocking release of the governor's travel and security records. Quote, anybody who tries to brush this off as a who cares about a lectern is missing the entire point of it all, he said. If the GOP had just bought the lectern in the first place, it's not an issue. But it's the question that remains. Now, the questions also focus on the decision to purchase the lectern from Beckett Events, a Virginia-based company run by political consultant and lobbyist Virginia Beckett. The company has not responded to requests for comment. A similar lectern model is listed online for $7,500. Most of them go for that or less. Sanders has said the one purchased by the state had additional features that contributed it to its costs, including a custom height and sound components. The cost also included a road case, shipping, handling, and a credit card fee. Hmm. Hmm. So the height and sound components and shipping more than doubled the cost. Okay. State Democrats have gleefully pointed out that they bought their party lectern for $5 from state surplus. (laughs) More broadly, 
The purchase has spurred questions about how records are handled. Tom Mars, an attorney who served as head of state police under Sanders' father, former Governor Mike Huckabee, has offered lawmakers the testimony of a client he says has firsthand knowledge of the governor's office interfering with public records requests. That includes a governor's office employee in September adding the undated to-be-reimbursed note to the original June invoice. Sanders' office has said the note was added to reflect the state had been reimbursed. Mm, mm, to be? Has been. Okay. Campbell has also filed a new Freedom of Information Act lawsuit seeking additional records about the lectern and challenging the governor's office claims that Sanders' husband, Brian's, state emails are exempt from public release. All right. From governor's lecterns and money to lawyers' guns and money, my interview with narrator of the new blockbuster podcast, John Cryer, after this quick break. Stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. I love autumn. It's sweater weather. But that means body odor comes with it because you're wearing extra layers. So enter Lumi Whole Body Deodorant, a pioneering product designed by an OBGYN. She invented Lumi, a unique pH-balanced solution, effective for up to 72 hours. It's even pH-balanced for safe use below the belt. It's the first deodorant safe for every crevice, from armpits to under boobs, even vulvas. And rather than masking smells, Lumi's mandelic acid formula acts as a pre-odorant. It prevents odor before it even begins. It's also been clinically proven to control odor better than a shower with soap. The average person has an odor level of 6 out of 10 12 hours after they shower with soap. But with Lumi, the average odor level is 0. 0 out of 10. I didn't know what to expect when I first started using Lumi, and I was very surprised. It's amazing. It works so well. Now I use it over my entire body. It works great. Even after my long runs or gym sessions, I still feel fresh. I cannot recommend Lumi enough. Lumi's starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice like a mini body wash, and my favorite, the deodorant wipes, plus free shipping. As a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code DAILYBEANS at LumiDeodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit LumiDeodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. That's a $5 discount off a Lumi starter pack or over 40% off when you go to LumiDeodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I am super excited today talking to one of my favorite people. You know him as Lex Luthor. You've probably seen him on Two and a Half Men. I know him best, and the listeners of this show probably know him best as Ducky Dale from Pretty in Pink. Please welcome John Cryer. How's it going? Hey, it's going good. How are you? I'm really well. I'm so excited to talk to you because you're working on a new project, and I'm, I really want to hear all about it. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, and thankfully, it's not uh, a project that I'm on strike for. So I can talk about it to my heart's <laughs> intent. Woo uh, no, it, it, uh, the the project that I'm I'm really jazzed about, and I'm glad that we're going to actually be, be working together on it in, in many ways, is um, a thing called Lawyers, Guns, and Money. It's a podcast that I worked on with a guy named Jack Bryan, who, uh, who did Active Measures, which I don't know if you remember that documentary. And he, he came to me... Uh, uh, telling me that he met a guy who had the, the the craziest story, one of the craziest stories he'd ever heard. And it turns out that it was the reason that the Iran-Contra scandal came to light. And and that was it was such a, a fascinating and frankly wild story that uh, he said, would you want to be a part of it? And I was, yeah, you know, that I, I had dim memories of it when I was, uh, you know, from because I was like, I think I was 21. I think Pretty in Pink actually came out. Right around the time that Iran Cantor broke. <laughs> I think it was, yeah, it was 86. That was February of 86. Well, everybody knows Pretty in Pink was a co social commentary on um, Iran Cantor. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was about the White House uh, abuse of power in uh, Central America. Um, it was it was underlying it was uh it, it was a metaphor for that <laughs> um, but uh yeah you're on your own you're on your own yeah i could i could it's it, it works <laughs> um but uh but now do you remember much about iran contra a little bit um but you know I, I the the great thing about this is that it really sparked all those kind of memories uh from when it you know when it was when it was happening i was pretty young at the time uh i you know i was um just g getting into high school i believe and so you know it was talked about a little bit but not to the extent i think it, i just don't think we were old enough kind of i think the grown-ups in the room were like they're not old enough to get their heads around 
uh, what's going on here. But this this story about this guy, what is his name? John Mattis? John Mattis. Yeah, he was basically a public defender, kind of a little bit of an idealist. Uh, and this guy walks into his office, a guy, a guy named Jesus uh, uh, Morales, uh, and he's uh, he's been arrested for having a machine gun and a silencer. This is in Miami, Florida in 1985. So it's, you know, it's it's the Scarface era of Miami with, dr- you know, drug lords and and, uh, and and a lot of violence. And it was the, the Miami Vice was the was uh, about it at that time. And um, so this guy comes in with a machine gun and a silencer and uh, uh John Mattis is like, well, okay, we've got to, you know, we're going to figure out what's the defense for having a machine gun and silencer. Uh, and the guy says, don't, no, you don't have to worry about this. You don't have to worry about this because I'm actually working for the CIA shuttling weapons to Central America. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. And so John Mattis is like, uh-huh, sure you are. Sure. <laughs> I, I totally believe this. The guy handed him a phone number. John Mattis called it. Uh, and it was to the White House. Uh, and it, it ended up, uncovering this in this huge web of intrigue about how the white house was secretly was funding a secret war in nicaragua um against the law that that had been explicitly you know ruled against the law by the u.s congress yeah so at the time when this blew up uh i mean i remember from the time that it was it was all about would uh would this scandal uh, actually get to ronald reagan but you know did he know about this now of course in retrospect of course he knew about this. Um, you know, I, I, he was the president, for Christ's sake. It's, a, it's a, a secret war conducted by the CIA. Of course he knew about it. But at any rate, uh, you know, at the time, you know, I, I still had kind of dim memories of what was uh, what was going on, what happened then, because there was this guy named Oliver North. Um, oh, Ollie North. Yes. <laughs> and, and who was basically, uh, he was, uh, uh, he had to go before Congress and testify, and he admitted that he was breaking the law by uh, by uh, funding these Central American uh, rebels against the Sandinista government because they were anti-communist. And he hated communism so much. And he was such a good American Boy Scout that he was willing to, you know, take the funds that he was uh, he was d- d- having some dealings with Iran and take that money. And he was going to give it to these uh, to these uh, freedom fighters in Nicaragua. And that's pretty much what America remembers. They remember this this Boy Scout who went up and took and and basically, you know, lifted up his right hand and said, I'm I'm the guy who did this, you know. But it turns out it was this huge story that had been going on for for, ye- for years before that. Um, and uh, uh, and the 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 real story is is absolutely bonkers. Uh, and that's what attracted me to the project. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of love that, you know, I've I've. Uh, had a, several interviews with Jack Bryan. We've had him on. We've talked about back when I was doing the Mueller podcast. We talked about the Active Measures documentary. But the you know there's there's a through line here between uh, what happened with the Mueller investigation and what happened with Iran Contra, and his name is Bill Barr. And so I, I think it's uh, fan, uh, fantastic that my friend uh, Jack Bryan has put together this story in a podcast form, and that we're gonna. We're going to have it um, coming up here on on MSW Media. I'm really excited about it. W- are, without giving too much away, what are some of the more anything shocking? I mean, I guess you kind of want to save those bits for, yes. for when the <laughs> when the podcast comes out. But there's but like you know, there's so much in here. There's so much to this story. Yeah. Yes. Um. Well, it's tough about the, the what was what was shocking to me was uh that. You know, it's interesting because very often uh, uh, we as Americans or as media consumers get transfixed by a certain part of a story, but we miss the other part of the story. You know, like uh, like uh, right. like most recently, the Mueller investigation is a good example where uh, Trump and his allies framed it as, you know, Russian collusion. You know, it's like, did we before the election uh, make a deal with the Russians for them to attack the, the election? Well, there wasn't evidence of that, but there was evidence of horrible stuff that they did. And be, but because there wasn't ev- evidence of that, people thought that it was a fruitless investigation, even though it it, it, it turned uh, you know multiple counts of obstruction of justice, uh, you know uh, all kinds of chicanery by the by the Trump campaign. Clearly, they tried to cooperate with this attack on our election. They made many efforts. They were just as inept at that as they were at governing later. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so, 
but but it is interesting. So many of the players that are that are were a huge part of Iran Contra um, end up they're still around, you know, and they uh, you know they're big m- influence on Michael Flynn. Uh, they're you know Bill Barr was uh, you know a big part of of uh, of, of hiding uh, you know sw- sweeping it all under the rug that first time, you know. <laughs> um, so, and another thing that was shocking to me about about this story was that right wing militias were involved in uh, you know that this was sort of the incipient time when right wing republican members of the white house would pursue regime change uh through white right wing militias from the united states who they would export to other countries you know and of course if you bring that around to january 6th you know they're doing it here now you know <laughs> um so yeah nothing's ever new right yes. everything new is old again and it's 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 all recycled obstruction by bill barr and and bullshit with right-wing militias uh it's 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 pretty fascinating all the kinds of through lines and threads and underpinnings that uh we see in both of these stories then and now you know yeah and the, and and the the funny thing is the the characters are all so nuts uh in this thing and it was well, because the cia used to uh, uh and they and, and i don't know to what extent they still do but when the cia was trying to do covert actions very often they uh they used criminal organizations in foreign countries um because they were because criminal organizations in foreign countries have a lot of infrastructure that's very useful to the cia um they did it uh when they were back before they were technically the cia when they were the oss which started during world war ii they would use you know, mafia connections in Italy because they were trying to undermine the the Mussolini government, Um, uh, you know, and they would use organized crime connections all over Europe to help their uh, their efforts. And that went through to the Vietnam War, where they would use drug traffickers, uh, you know, to help their the movements of their troops and to to uh, um, to give them reconnaissance and stuff like that. So criminal organizations have been really useful for the CIA for a long time. And uh, and that was a big shock to me was was understanding exactly how the CIA ends up having to work. You know, to some degree, it's understandable. It certainly was in World War Two. You know, um, uh, but it but it becomes a, a much bigger deal when you, when the war itself, when even the when even the 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 end of what they're fighting for isn't legal. That's where they they depart from. Uh, uh, you know, from uh, where I depart from understanding what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, yes. And hopefully they depart, but then they don't. Yes. Uh, and, <laughs> and then we end up doing podcasts. <laughs> so well, I'm really looking forward to the launch of this podcast. Uh, we're going to be talking about it a lot in the coming weeks. It's going to be coming out in about four weeks. Um, the first episode will drop on MSW Media. It's called Lawyers, Guns and Money. We'll have a trailer up for you so you can go and find and subscribe to that feed so that you'll know when when these episodes drop. Uh, and I'm, I think everybody's really going to enjoy this. I love that you're narrating it. You know, you're one of my favorite actors. So I really appreciate this this teaming up of you and my friend Jack to put this together. Any other final thoughts you want anybody to know anything specific about this or where people can, you know, find and follow and support you? Uh, well, you know, obviously I'm I'm all over social media, whether 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 you like it or not. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still working on, on stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, um, you know, this, this story is so much fun. And I think it leads to so many bigger things. And it's a great excuse to, to teach people the history of the Cold War, and, and how we got here, you know, I mean, that's what I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it's so funny because you, I, I, I often feel like the news is just seems so crazy. Just every day, there's just a whole new batch of crazy in the news. But what was fun about this story is it made me realize, oh no, that's always been there, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just weren't. We just didn't pay as much attention to it. And I, I do look forward to a time where I can go back to not knowing who the deputy chief of staff is. Yes, that um, would be wonderful. But, <laughs> but today is not that day. No. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, we we just had Prigozhin, who was, yeah. you know, oh. who was indicted by Mueller uh, on the top 10 FBI most wanted list is is now not a problem yes. anymore after being assassinated by by Putin. And, and yeah, you're right. It doesn't stop. Um, I think we're just I think we're just paying attention to it. So, yeah, um, thank you again. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Maybe we'll get to talk again before this thing drops and 
I look forward to that. But hopefully, I know you're uh, striking in solidarity, and um, but maybe that maybe the, we'll have a resolution uh, uh, at some point, and you can you can get back to work. My fingers are crossed. I want to. I really want to. <laughs> I, know, I know you do. All right. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, we will talk later, right. everybody. Thank uh, you. Please. Please stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey, everybody. My Helix mattress is more than just a bed. It's a late night refuge where I recharge and dream. It's personalized to exactly the way I sleep, and that makes bedtime my favorite time. I, you know I love sleep. Now I sleep better than ever, and I can't thank Helix enough. Just go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. And you'll get 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. Now, everyone has a different way of sleeping, and Helix knows this, so they offer a variety of mattress models tailored for specific sleep positions and preferences. They have over 20 unique mattresses at Helix in their lineup, including the award-winning Lux Collection and their newly released Elite Collection. Plus, they even have options for big and tall sleepers and the little ones, too. The key to finding your perfect fit is that Helix Sleep Quiz. It's an easy way to find the perfect mattress that's designed to complement your body and sleep style. Once you place your order, your mattress will be delivered right to your doorstep at no extra cost. I was matched with a Helix Midnight because I like a medium firm mattress and I sleep on my side. Simply put, this mattress has changed my life and I'm never going back to anything else. Helix also offers a 100 night in-home trial and a solid 10 to 15 year warranty. Sleep on it, dream on it, and decide on it. You won't regret it. And right now, Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and use code HELIXPARTNER. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have good news, confessions, corrections, you want to play what I guess what your pet is. It could be a cow, it could be a horse, it could be a dog or a cat. Anything you want to send to me, I'll take a guess. I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. I feel like I'm the best at horses, but uh, that that could change over time. You know, it's a numbers game. Also, if you have a shout out to a loved one or yourself, tell me what you're doing this week that's amazing. Or you want to send in your thesis or dissertation titles. I love those. Or a whoopee story or like blankies. Or, or stuffed animals, if you've got one of those in your family, or if you still have yours, I want to hear about it. Uh, also, if you don't have pod pet tax to pay, you can send us an adoptable pet in your area or give a shout out to a small business that could use some support or tell us about your small business or your project or what you're making or creating. I'd love to hear about it. Send it all to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. All right. First step from anonymous, no pronouns, nothing too exciting, but I started working out every morning, two weeks in, and I'm sore, but feeling accomplished. And I listen every morning to Daily Beans on my walk. Thanks for the great pod. Pet tax, Kita, Colby, and Bronx, my pumpkin patch. The cats certainly were not happy about this situation. <laughs> okay. So they're all wearing pumpkin hats. The dog's like, yup, yup. I love the pumpkin hat. Look at, look at my pumpkin hat. And the cats are like, fuck you. <laughs> oh, these are great. What a beautiful little breed you got. Thank you for sending that in. And it is exciting. That is a huge accomplishment. Two weeks in a row every day. That's amazing. I'm so proud. All right. Next, uh, I need to start. I need to get back to every day. Evan J, pronouns he and him. A correction. Love you both. And I listen without fail every day. I'm that guy who talked about his Transformers podcast that I started over a year ago. And thanks to you. Uh, I always can speak with confidence about current events, thanks to y'all. On Friday, you had good news about the Willamette River in Portland. It's one of my favorite wineries out there. So keen to put on a shirt the way we remember how to say it correctly. It's Willamette, damn it. It's Willamette, damn it. Ah, I got it. Like, damn it, Janet. Willamette. Thank you for everything you do. I'll continue listening every single freaking day. Evan, I hope I can remember that because it looks like it should be Willamette, but it's Willamette, damn it. And I'll try to remember that. You're wonderful, ladies. Uh, you're better than a cup of coffee, but I always have the coffee just in case. <laughs> it's the best for everyone else around me. Me too, Evan. Also, we had several listeners write in to correct the pronunciation of Willamette. Our editor, Desiree, would like to be on the record as knowing the correct pronunciation, knew the right way, but was helpless to fix it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Des. <laughs> Willamette. I'm going to remember. I promise. I'll do my best. 
Next up from Veronica, pronouns she and her. My running buddy and I love listening to the beans each morning during our tour of the neighborhood. Neil, named after Neil Caffrey from White Collar because he's so handsome, like Matt Bomer, and definitely plays the long con like Neil, haha, is pictured below for pet tax. He's owned us for about 18 months and is the perfect combination of snuggle buddy and clown. Oh, that's the best. Uh, I've included his DNA report uh, for you to double check your what the mutt skills. He's a combo of some pretty easy to guess breeds with a surprise breed thrown in for good measure. Love the post and your breakdown of the craziness we're living through right now. Thanks for all you do. Okay, boxer and lab maybe. Um, definitely looks like a boxer. Pity staffy, uh, and then thrown in Pomeranian. <laughs> Here it is. Boxer, Pitbull, Staffy, and Cattle Dog. I got three out of four, y'all. That is like one of the best I've ever done. It was the weird one that I didn't get. Australian Cattle Dog. All righty. And then a little bit of Labrador. There's the other one that I got. Oh, sorry. Four out of five I got right. Thank you for that. He's a beautiful baby. Neil. Neil, Neil, Orange Peel. If you can tell me what show that's from, Neil, Neil, Orange Peel, I'll be very impressed. All right, next up, we have Alyssa. No pronouns. Hey, Queens, oh, the beans. The other day, y'all read a story from a listener about her granny. Call me sis. It was so sweet and it made me wish I could talk to my grandmas. I thought, since y'all like pictures and what's cuter than a grandma, I'd share the pictures I have of my grandmas. They're on my wall with the rest of my loved ones who have passed. There's even a baby in one. Me. For Dana. Pet tax of my dogs and cat. The blonde uh, German shepherd dog is Harley Quinn. The little mutt, want to guess? We only have a guess as well from the vet. Is Dove, more commonly known as Dovey. And the cat is Willow. The grandma's collage clockwise from top left is one-year-old me, my great-grandma, Quinn, then two-year-old me and my grandma, Dina, then me after uh, uh, and my great-grandma, Brooks, finally grumpy me and my grandma, Margaret. I had grandma, Margaret. We called her Grammy. Anyways, thanks so much for the news and the swearing. Y'all make the all-too-often disheartening news a bit more palatable and less depressing. Thank you. That's the that's the whole reason I'm here, Alyssa. Look at these Grammys. I love the, oh, there's the grumpy you. I see it. Love it. I love the grandma collage. All right, let's see these doggos. The little one. Yeah, it looks like a looks like a golden in a lab mixed together. The vet thinks Dovey is a whippet in a lab. Okay, cool. Whippet. I'll take it. Whip it good. Thank you so much for that submission. Beautiful pod pet tax. Next up, Kate, pronoun she and her. Hello, Leguminati. Bo body, banana fan of fofati. Me, my, mo means beans. Wonderful introduction. I'm here in your good news ears for the first time to shout out my soulmate friend who's fighting the good fight with intelligence, creativity, and humor. She and I met on the front lines of the community mental health scene and, although generations apart, Instantly bonded over our fierce determination to call out injustice and provoke change while serving those who have been pushed into the margins and worse. In recent years, she has employed her brilliance and self-taught artist to reimagine classic works of art while depicting the hypocrisy of the pyramid scam that is MAGA world. And she's been accepted into three fantastic shows. If you were in the Chicago area, you might have seen her take on Diego Rivera's famous mural with DT, Donald Trump, playing center villain at the Art Center Highland Park. Zoom in and you'll see many of his self-serving minions. It's like a Where's Waldo of fascist idiots. My favorite is Mike Pence and his fly or the Kraken Sidney Powell. If you love art and you love Mock and Maga, you will love her work. You can follow her on Insta at no Trump Art. Or on her website, makeartgreatagain.org, where you can buy prints of her work and read her deft analysis of art history and politics. Though the birth of Vino might make you throw up in your mouth a little bit. Lastly, she's an amazing friend who has kept me sane throughout the hardest periods of my life. Being single and a psychologist, absorbing a fire hose of trauma through a pandemic while an army of mediocre arseholes were in charge nearly broke me. She kept me afloat with humor and aplomb, and just plain badassery, and I couldn't be more grateful. Oh, thank you for that shout-out, Kate. Again, that's at no Trump Art on Insta, 
or her website, makeartgreatagain.org. It's an O-R-G. These murals are fantastic. Wonderful. Oh, look, there's the QAnon guy. Oh, my goodness. These are beautiful. The colors are incredible. Incredible use of color. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing that. And uh, I believe this is our last submission today, and it comes from Clint B. in Louisiana. Good morning. I've been listening to The Beans for a couple weeks now. It's helped me commit to my morning workout routine. My good news is my husband and I celebrated our fifth wedding anniversary on Friday. Congratulations. Uh, that was October 27th. He and I started dating in the summer of 2016. I told him that if we survived a Trump presidency, a global pandemic, an attempted coup, and dangling on the edge of World War III, there is nothing stopping us from making it to 50. We are the proud dads of two amazing golden doodles, Tucker and Cooper. They are biological brothers from different litters. A paw tax picture is attached. Tucker is in the photo with the hat. He's wearing a red harness in the other. Cooper is wearing the blue-green harness in the second picture. I hope their smiles brighten your day. Love listening to The Beans, clean up on aisle 45, and Jack. Thanks for all you do to help us stay informed. Keep up the good work. Have the best day. P.S. Representative Mike Johnson is my congressional rep, and he's a douchebag of the highest order. Ugh, Clint. Oh, you're right. I'm so sorry. But these dogs, these doodles, are so adorable. Oh, my God. I do love their smiles. Thank you. I needed that, especially at the end of the good news here today. Thank you for that submission. Everybody, send your stuff in. We need it this week. Send it to us at dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. Don't forget to donate to oust the 18 that voted for Mike Johnson that are sitting in Biden districts. Links in the show notes. Swingleft.org slash fundraise slash how we win 2024. Thank you all so much for those who have contributed. If everybody just gives a dollar that listens to this show, holy majoli, we will blow that goal away. And and just thanks to everybody for listening, hanging in there with me. I've been solo all week. I brought in some great guests. And I'm looking forward to ha- to Fugelsang Fridays, where we'll have John Fugelsang on. Um, that's just going to be a blast. Dana comes back, uh, I think, on Thursday's episode. I think she'll be back to record on Halloween. So that episode will come out Thursday. I miss her so much. I miss you, Dana. I know you're listening. I have so many baby pictures saved up for you. Thank you all. Uh, and uh, don't forget to check out the latest episode of Jack. It's it's pretty entertaining. Andy McCabe is funny as fuck. Y'all, he is really funny. He cracked so many jokes <laughs> this last episode. He had me laughing, like, for most of it. Like, he is truly, truly a funny fellow. Uh, And don't forget to tune in to clean up on Wednesday. All right, everybody, until tomorrow, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, take care of the planet, take care of your mental health, Uh, take care of your family, vote blue over Q, and bring someone with you. I've been AG, and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill, with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane, with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for the Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>